anyone know why they're not looking at prevention trials, even though the amount of trials are seven control trials, six of them prospective, three of them randomized, 2,400 patients showing a protective effect of over 91%, rivaling and even besting those of vaccines. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Betsy Ashton. I'm the creative director of the FLCCC Alliance. And welcome to folks from all over the world. Uh, I see we've got New Zealand, we've got Germany, we've got British Columbia, we've got all over the United States. And if you haven't Thomas put into Hain. chat where you're from, we welcome you to do here. that. Tonight, we are here. We're going to discuss a decision that was handed down today by a panel of the World Health Organization on ivermectin. Uh, one that doctors who treat patients who are in the ICUs and the ERs and who are family practitioners all over the world, they've been calling, and they're pretty upset about. Uh, so fasten your seatbelts, folks, because we're we're going to have a lively discussion tonight. Now, uh, I must tell you that we are here. This is our weekly update. We're here once a week to tell you what's happening in the treatment of COVID that our doctors know works. Uh, we're here live for 30 to 45 minutes uh, to give you the latest information and to answer your questions. That's what a lot of you care about, and we know that. And so we are going to get to your questions tonight. Uh, we uh, have our Dr. Pierre Corey. He's supposed to be on vacation this week. He's with his family somewhere wonderful. We won't tell you exactly where, but I got to tell you, he's been working an awful lot this week anyway. It's hard for him to get any time off but he is going to answer your questions and he's going to fill you in on, on our leading story. Uh, an important disclaimer, we always have to tell you as we discuss this information today, please remember that this is not medical advice for you personally, because we're not your personal physician. We don't know what's going on inside your body. So you take the information that you get here to your personal physician and discuss it with him or her, please. Um, now, what can you expect from us tonight? Well, you got a short welcome from me. You just got that already. And then you're going to have about five to seven minutes, pretty short tonight, about five minutes of the latest updates on news uh, that we think is worthy that you may have not heard about anywhere else. And then maybe 15 or 20 minutes from our Dr. Pierre Corey, who is a critical care physician. He is a medical textbook author, one of the best-selling authors out uh, out there from one of the best-selling textbooks. And he's the author of many, many published scientific studies. And he happens to be, we are blessed to have him as the president of the FLCCC Alliance. You'll hear from him shortly. And um, I have also tell you, we are, what is the FLCCC Alliance? We're a 501c3 organization. We're a nonprofit organization and we're not making any money off any of the treatments or any of the drugs that are part of the treatment that we're telling you about. Unlike a lot of the people who are against the treatments that, that we have out there who are making a lot of money off alternative things, but we'll talk, discuss that later. We are not. We are simply, it's a group that came together last spring when this pandemic was just hitting the United States and the doctors came together to say, what can we do to try to help patients, to try to deal with this, and to try to get people well? And that's the idea. This is about medicine. Uh, it's about trying to save people's lives. It's trying to alleviate suffering. And that's all we're really about. But in order to do this, um, we do need some donations to help in order to get the word out to make the videos that you'll see that we're doing um, it takes money editors writers all of this gathering information so if if it's possible for you to help we really really appreciate it now then um, for the update let's take a look at the news news is pretty much one story today for us the world health organization what did they do they issued the results of the panel studying the use of the repurposed 
anti-parasitic drug ivermectin for treating COVID-19 and declared the current evidence to be inconclusive. Until more data is available, the WHO recommends that the drug only be used within clinical trials. They advise that ivermectin not be prescribed for use outside of a clinical trial. Well, this came as a shock to many physicians around the world who have seen remarkable results in treating patients at all stages of COVID with ivermectin. Many of them are members of the FLCCC Alliance, and you'll hear our response to the WHO panel's decision shortly from our Dr. Pierre Corey, who wrote the soon to be published review study of ivermectin's use against COVID-19. Meanwhile, in the United Kingdom, Pharmacy Magazine recently reported on the positive attributes of ivermectin. They noted that the drug is included in the WHO's model list of essential medicines. And more interestingly, the U on online, UK's online media is reporting on the recent British ivermectin recommendation development, that's the BIRD group recommendation, that the drug be immediately rolled out to the public for the prevention of COVID-19 at least on an emergency basis. Pharmacy Magazine shared the recent meta-analysis of 15 randomized controlled trials, coupled with observational studies, demonstrating significant safety and efficacy, both for treatment and <laughs> prophylaxis targeting COVID-19. Studies covering nearly 4,000 patients. Well, in this country, if you watch major media, you hear only about the vaccines and all the newspapers and the channels are reporting a surge in cases despite increases in the number vaccinated. A third wave, uh, possibly from spring break and Easter and Passover holiday gatherings is expected. People may be relaxed. Maybe some states are opening too soon. Hard to know exactly what it is, but maybe, maybe we still need treatment. Dr. Corey, I think we need you. Are you there? I'm here. I'm here. Thanks, Betsy, for the intro. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I don't know where to begin. Um, it seems like we're beginning at square one again and again. Uh, we've been here before, right? So um, let, let's talk about it. Uh, let's see. I'm going to share my screen. You know, I got to tell you, I don't like talking about this stuff. I just want to talk about doctoring, how to get patients better, how to heal. I like talking about disease. I, I don't want to have to examine society and how dysfunctional it is. Uh, it's not really my thing, but I have also been challenged to try to understand what's happening. Why, why we're not listening to the science, why the data uh, that's helping patients get better is not being primarily emphasized. And you know, a, a gentleman, a physician uh, wrote to me uh, this week, and um, he alerted me to an article, which is kind of interesting. It's, it's basically the study of how corporations sort of achieve their missions. Um, and it's actually a very disturbing article. Um, but I, I, what I've come to understand, what's going on with the WHO uh, is no different than what we've seen in history. So if you look at the history of big tobacco, what they were able to achieve over decades with regulatory agencies and how they operated the coal and oil industries, right? We're not in global warming. We're being convinced that the world is not boiling over. Um, the sugar industry, you know, fat was bad for decades. Now everybody counts carbs. Right? So there's been fights over time. And when you see the tactics, um, they're really disturbing. And what I liked is it gave me kind of a protocol to understand the stuff that's happened to ivermectin, to the FLCCC, as well as to myself. And so he talked about how this uh, union of concerned scientists, they were able to identify the five pillars and they've gotten this from lobbyists and uh, disinformation specialists who work for corporations, but the five pillars, um, and they talked about it and I thought about it in terms of what's happening, right? So first of all, why would someone, what, what would be the financial incentive against ivermectin? And the problem is, is that there's many, right? One is clearly it would interrupt or disrupt the mass global vaccination strategy that we embarked on. Um, that would be a huge disruptor for it. And so I could see why many, even possibly well-intentioned, uh, would not want ivermectin to do that. Um, others are that they're clear competitors, right? We've seen what Merck did, right? They put out this nonsensical statement. It was a bald-faced attempt 
to discredit ivermectin in favor of their uh, you know, new oral antiviral they want to bring to market. And the way in which they sort of achieve their aims, and these are the kind of the five plays in the playbook. One is called the fake. And so I tried to think of an example of this. I don't know that I've seen what I think is counterfeit science, but what I have seen is I've seen medical journals preferentially publish negative studies rather than the positive ones. And we saw that in JAMA. That's a very problematic study. That's been widely attacked by people who are not the FLCCC. If you look at the JAMA uh, website for that article, many doctors instantly criticized many aspects of that study. Uh, and in fact, there's even a move to retract it. So I don't know if that's an example of that, but uh, the blitz, I wonder, are there any scientists who spoke out who've been harassed, <laughs> who've spoken out with results or views? I mean, Betsy, you know all the, all the journalists who've interviewed me and done me so rightly in the press and said such nice glowing things about me. Um, so yeah, that little love campaign didn't happen. Uh, we've seen some really insane articles being written that are full of mistruths uh, about myself and about the science. And what I want to talk about today is I, I really can only view the WHO uh, statement in line with the other statements from the NIH, the EMA and Merck, which is that they're trying to manufacture uncertainty about science where little or none exists. And if you go back to the top, this is not just about ivermectin. It's about the nutritional industry, the coal and oil industry, and the big tobacco. It's a, this is not a novel thing. And so to see these tactics is one of the things that I've been saying to my colleagues is when I see their moves and the documents they put out, like it's so not subtle. It's just not subtle. It's not even sophisticated the way they do it. It's so ham handed and it's so blatant that they're being disingenuous and or falsifying the reality. And it's so, it's just sad watching these plays play out. But that's what I think of the WHO. I'm just being honest. That, that's the only way I can interpret it because it's not about the science. I know what the science is because I know many people around the world who are delving deep into the science. And what the WHO did today completely departs from the expert groups around the world that I've come to, to call colleagues. So uh, and then there's the screen. Buy credibility through alliances with academia or professional societies. Hmm. I wonder if that's happening around ivermectin. Have you seen the IDSA statement? Today, the WHO actually supported their position by referencing Merck. I mean, I thought that was like the, 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 the craziest thing I've ever heard. Oh, so you want to use a pharmaceutical company who's clearly compromised with other incentives as support for your recommendation. It, it, it's just really, uh, it's unconscionable. And then the fix, I'm not going to get into the fix because we already know about some stuff there, but I'm not ready to talk about it. But um, anyway, that, that's how I view that. that. That's how I'm going to set the table to talk about the who. Let's, let's look, actually look at what they did today. So if you actually look at their statement, it was quite short, the one on their website. And then there's a Reuters uh, article. And if you look at the language that they used, it was really, I wouldn't say brilliant. It was really just, it was so obviously biased. But they don't mention that the majority of studies find really important benefits. All they do is talk about that results, not positive results, the results, the outcomes are all low quality or low certainty. We know that's not true. There's a number of expert groups that graded the quality and they actually find it moderate, including the lead research of the WHO. So that, I'm sorry, is a lie. And then they actually talk about very few placebo controlled trials. And I gotta tell you guys how they're shifting the goalposts here. This is the unsubtle stuff. So as a physician and a scientist, every time in my career, I've tried to use observational controlled trials to prove a point or to support a therapy. It's been dismissed because they're observational, they're, they're retrospective, they have confounders. And so the observational always can uh, attack because they're not randomized. They're moving the goalposts. Now you have a massive amount of randomized control trials. Consider the gold standard and guess what they're doing? They're attacking randomized control trials because they don't have placebo. Are you nuts? This is a pandemic. Everybody's trying to treat with everything. All you need to know is that the, the, the trial was controlled, meaning that the big, big difference between the intervention group and the control group was ivermectin. All the other stuff stayed the same. And in all the trials, that's what happened. You had a controlled trial. Yes, it wasn't placebo, but this is a complicated disease. It needs combination therapy. And so we know there's other therapies going on, but each one was controlled. And so again, disingenuous and, and really uh, almost just fraudulent. 
And then they specifically mentioned that we're not looking at trials of prevention. Anyone out there, I wish I could like get a sea of hands. Anyone know why they're not looking at prevention trials, even though the amount of trials are seven controlled trials, six of them prospective, three of them randomized, 2,400 patients showing a protective effect of over 91%, rivaling and even besting those of vaccines. So uh, I, I can hear you. I see all the hands up on, on, on why they're not looking at that data. It's really troubling. So the other thing is the WHO today, they come up with a recommendation which matches the NIHs of six months ago. Yeah. So we presented to the NIH two months ago, they reviewed the data, they reviewed it again in February, they upheld their neutral recommendation. Yet the WHO goes one better, or I should say one worse, and they move backwards. Okay, so the WHO is smarter than the NIH or more criminal, I'm not sure, but you guys can decide. Um, and they actually are using less evidence. It's stated that they're using 16 trials. We presented to them 17 trials. The last thing, and this is the most baldly false argument, this jumped off the page to me, but the co-chair of the guideline is quoted as saying, the data available was sparse and likely based on chance. First of all, can we all agree that sentence makes no sense and cannot stand on its own? What do you mean the data was likely based on chance? You mean the incredibly positive results on mortality? Well, if that's what they did mean, but they specifically didn't say that, they say the data available is sparse likely based on chance. Well, I would like to ask that person, how come your research team lead, Dr. Andy Hill, in January, based on 17 randomized controlled trials, calculated that the probability of the findings of ivermectin on survival are due to chance is one in 5,000. So it's near nil that these findings are due to chance, yet this guy comes out and says it. I, I, I got to tell you, I'm just speechless, guys. I can't keep doing this. I can't keep, I, I mean, I just, what do you want me to do? It, this is not subtle and it's just ridiculous, ridiculous. So I'm just going to give you the lowdown again. I mean, I, I'm going to call myself an expert at ivermectin and COVID. That's what my life has become. That's all I do. I speak, I say the word ivermectin 75,000 times a day. Uh, my children who vary in age from 10 to 16 could give any lecture that I give. Um, that's all they hear is ivermectin in the household and I'm literally going crazy. But here's the reality is that I know that Andy Hill of Unitate and WHO, he has the results of over 25 randomized controlled trials and they come out with a recommendation based on 16. So they're purposely looking at only a subset so they can delay so that we can wait till August till they can review the others. Anyone think there's a public health emergency going out there? If you do, what would be the definition of emergency? Like all hands on deck, focus, get through this data and come up with a credible one? No, they're not doing that. But you have to know, and let's be clear here, we're talking about lives, people. The data shows that the reduced risk of death by 75%, that's absolute. That means of every nine people you treat with ivermectin, six of them would be saved that otherwise would have died. You're talking about thousands, if not millions of lives, and the clock is ticking. I mean, it's, it's, it's insupportable, unconscionable, and egregious. From prevention, again, the seven control trials, over 2,400 patients, we know all of those low and middle income countries, all of those places who either can't take a vaccine, don't have the vaccine, don't have access, you could have a countermeasure, an alternative that you could deploy around the world and save millions of lives and prevent tons of morbidity yet they're ignoring it. They purposely, maybe they don't have the resources. I guess, you know, all of these organizations, they had the money to do Operation Warp Speed and come up with eight different vaccines. I'm, I don't know if it's eight, but it sounds like it's eight. Every day it's a new pharma company peddling a new vaccine. So millions and hundreds of millions of development into vaccines and nobody could assign a, a small little team. I, I'm available, that's all I do anyway. Oh, actually, that's all I've done for the last three months. The problem is no one's paying me to do it. Um, you could look at this data. Apparently they're choosing not to. Let's be clear, the people are dying, health systems around the world increasingly stressed, still getting overwhelmed, and early treatment matters. You can change this disease, you can, de you can offload the hospitals, you can prevent death and disease. And, and we know it's working. There's tons of countries around the world who went rogue on the WHO. I think what the WHO did to me, that's my opinion, they made themselves completely irrelevant today. They totally came out and showed that they are not acting in the best interest of humanity and that their guidance should no longer be looked to or followed. 
I'm sorry, that's just my opinion. And, and what they really did is they showed what our system is built on, which is that our system is just so vulnerable to influence by competing financial and other misguided influences. And those influences, they lead into these crazy actions that we can't make sense of on the ground. So if you're trying to make sense of it, I gave you my, uh, my attempt today. Um, I wanna try to get to maybe more positive stuff. Um, yeah. I mean, he, here's a funny one about Francis Collins, right? So he said on 60 Minutes a few weeks ago, we know that he's the director of NIH. We know the vaccines are not going to reach everybody across the entire planet. Uh, people are going to continue to get sick. We need treatments for those people. Sounds great, Francis. He, although he's a proponent, it's not the whole answer. We want something that has broad efficacy against the whole family of coronavirus. Man, I wish we had that. I really wish we could find something like Francis. <clears throat> A big need right now, <coughs> sorry, is for a drug that you could take by mouth <coughs> that you could be offered as soon as you had a positive test and that would reduce the likelihood that the virus is gonna make you really sick. I mean, it, he's like dreaming. I mean, he's, dream he's having a fantasy there of this magic pill. Guess what, Francis? You guys, I'm gonna make a pitch for donations, but I think today we need a special cause. Donate to the FLCC so we can buy Francis a plane ticket to Mexico City. Yeah, right. Because let me tell Francis what happened in Mexico City, December 29th. <coughs> Their leading healthcare agency decided to adopt what Francis said, which is a test and treat strategy. 250 testing locations all around Mexico City. I don't know how many people live there. I think it's like 18 million. You got a rapid test. If you tested positive, you got ivermectin. What happened right after December 29th? Boom, you see this massive precipitous drop in hospitalizations and fatalities. And again, I, if I don't mention this every time, I have to. This is Juan Chimie's work. He does this around the clock. He's constantly watching what's happening in the world around ivermectin. But for the first time just this past week, the deaths from those that tested positive in Mexico City went under those who tested negative and those who are not tested, or actually those who are not tested. They're literally decimating the case fatality rate of COVID in Mexico City. So like I said, guys, got to send Francis uh, Collins a, a, a plane trip. We'll put him up a hotel. We can schedule him some meetings with some of the health officials in Mexico City, and they might be have a little chat. Let's, let's send the whole WHO panel, don't you think? There maybe, you yeah, actually, how about we charter a plane? But we need more right. money, guys, so listen to that. We need more money. But here's the deal. Look at, the, look at this data for the case fatality rates. So case fatality rates has nothing to do with social distancing, nothing to do with masks, has nothing to do with mobility. It just means what happens once you get COVID. What are your chances of dying? And what's happened since December 29th to our octogenarians? Those of them who are over 80, their case fatality rates are now dropping to 22%. If you look similarly in those who are 60 and over, 60 to 80, down to almost single digits. And if you see they're dropping by 30, 50, 60%, the case fatality rates amongst all age groups. That's because ivermectin is being used widely in that country. It's not subtle. I mean, this is crazy. Um, the uh, last thing I want to sort of finish with, I got five more minutes or three more minutes, is just some testimonials, all from doctors. This is one doctor who actually herself got sick, really terrible uh, hospital course. She lost, I think she writes it there, 24 kilograms in total. And then she had eight months of horrific long haul. She discovers our work uh, from Francois, who has been very supportive of ivermectin, and look at her, uh, her, 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 her history. She just says that everything got better. She thinks it's a miracle. She's sharing her experiences and she thanks us again for the research and the education. And so again, this is the stuff that keeps me going. Every time that the who and the, all these other idiots knock us down, I, I, I get this stuff. And so this was just a short one or a, a piece of an email from a family medicine doctor. Notice I don't include any of their uh, names because many of them have asked me not to say where they work or their names because of the judgment they'll receive. So it's like people are doing this like in the closet. It's just crazy. Um, but she said that she's just had such awesome results with our protocols. It's been the craziest and favorite three to four months of my career. Just like Jackie Stone said last week, she said like, she's bored now with COVID. They're having no problems with it. It's almost fun, right? She's just treating and people are getting better. And then 
Last one, uh, this is a crazy case. A patient um, of a physician came after a vaccination, and this has been happening. A lot of people have been getting COVID soon after uh, the vaccine. Uh, and I'm not quite sure why that keeps happening, but we keep seeing reports and data on it. But the patient was really sick and he put him on the IMS protocol and he just said, boom, he turned around, uh, he felt great. He feels like a lone voice and he would be happy to discuss privately with you where I work. And he sent us another contribution. So I really appreci Yay. appreciate that support. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. And then just some other good news. So uh, Dr. Santin, uh, Mary Beth Pfeiffer, a, a journalist who's been really writing a lot about ivermectin, uh, who's just been incredible in the data that she uncovers, but a very prominent Yale, very renowned cancer researcher has been amazed over his cancer patients and what ivermectin has done. He's treated many, many patients and he is just blown away by how well it works. And he came out in support. So this is someone from the ivory tower with a big voice and I hope people listen. Um, and then here's another cool little thing. I saw this, this is just from a tweet. So it's not like heavily referenced, but uh, apparently there's a report of people in, in Portugal starting to make noise. Now we know what's happening in Europe, right? The EMA came out with their recommendation, but Eastern Europe, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Macedonia, right? Bulgaria, they're starting to use it. But France, Belgium, Spain, Netherlands, they're all nuts. But here you have Portugal. So, so maybe there's, there's suddenly some movement in Western Europe. Uh, and this is just to show the data in Zimbabwe. They are absolutely decimating the curve here compared to the US. We're doing better, but we're nowhere near in terms of fatalities per 100,000. We still have a lot of people dying in this country. Remember Belize, they were one of the first very first countries to adopt ivermectin. They did that mid-December, if you look here, and boom, they're having no problems in Belize. Um, and then another cool piece of news, uh, Professor Satoshi Amura, who won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of ivermectin from his institute, his team did a massive review of not only COVID, but of ivermectin, and they concluded uh, that the evidence was in support and it should be widely adopted. So it's not just the FLCCC, folks. Um, and then the last thing that happened this week is some crazy stuff. The Netherlands is, is, is uh, threatening licenses of people who uh, prescribe uh, ivermectin and the Philippines as well. So much so they had a big hearing. They invited me uh, to, to testify and it was 12 hours ahead. The hearing started at 1 a.m. And I oh. didn't speak until 6.50 a.m. So I was like kind of passing out from under my cuneum for five hours. And I woke up and I was so annoyed that I like completely went off and I think I was screaming, but everyone really liked it. In fact, some of the MPs were applauding, but uh, that was kind of an insane uh, uh, session, but um, I don't know. I, I gave it like I, I have it and, and hopefully they'll listen. Um, last thing I'm gonna say before we go to questions is please help us. If you guys listen tonight, the other side is deep guys. They have deep pockets. They know how to do this better than I can. We're figuring out as we can and we have really very little resources. And so uh, if you guys can't give a lot, find someone you know who's wealthy, who can really uh, uh, inject us with, with, with a boost because um, Although today was a really a disaster and I think it was almost criminal, uh, neglectful, um, we're going to keep fighting, um, but we really do need your help. I, we got a lot of people that want to help us, that can't help us, but uh, to survive, we need the support. So please do that and I'll stop there. So thank you. Hello, hello, hello. Well, we've got a lot of questions. I've just got to tell you that we heard something from one of our doctors in Ohio who said, we have 200, I think Fred Wagshaw is perfectly happy to have his name used. He's a leading pulmonologist. Not Fred's he one was, of us. Yes, we have 295 patients on ivermectin. This is prevention and treatment. And nobody, nobody has needed to go to a hospital. Nobody, you know? This is like, hello. This is what we're hearing from people all over the world. Doctors all over the world are telling us this. So what can I say? So let's go to the questions. And I've got a whole bunch of them here. Okay. From the very beginning, many people, many people are asking, where do you go from here? <laughs> mm. Me personally or the FLCCC? Well, I guess the FLCCC, perhaps. Yeah, um, I, I, I don't really know. We, we have some expert support on how to, to message and try to influence and disseminate knowledge. And uh, we're gonna continue to rely on them, but mostly I'm just gonna keep following the science, keep disseminating it. We know that doesn't, I've come to learn that doesn't really work. I don't think this is a data argument anymore because 
it's not about the data. We can give them as much data as they want. They're going to swat it away. They're going to do what they do. They're going to do that, whatever that thing was I called it, the deception uh, or the diversion. Um, yeah, well, you have Merck that, uh, how, many, how many decades did they give away ivermectin and said it was perfectly safe and wonderful? Then they put out a press release in the last month saying it's not safe, duh. It's oh, so, have another drug in the pipeline that's coming out that'll be much more expensive, right? If you look at all of those other controversies I mentioned at the beginning from the oil industry and climate science, there's one refrain that, you, that everyone who's listening should be very mindful of. It's become a trigger word for me, but anytime I hear someone who doesn't accept something because they think there's insufficient evidence. Insufficient evidence, that's a trigger word. It means that there is sufficient evidence, but they're trying to dismiss it. And, and so I don't know what the sufficient evidence bar is. They're just gonna keep raising it higher. You're seeing what they're doing with the randomized controlled trials. They raise it higher and higher and higher. So it's not about the data. Um, what I will say is this, I'm gonna continue taking strength and satisfaction from every region, every country in the world that we can paint green. We keep a map and we know who's listening. Every testimonial, every doctor, every person who calls me that I get to treat with ivermectin, those are the things that are gonna keep us going. We're gonna get, keep doing that. I gotta tell you, it's going to happen. It's, it's just painfully and criminally gonna take a long time. That's all I have to say. Alicia Patterson Peterson would like to know, do I have to be sick to get a prescription for ivermectin or can I call and get a script just to be prepared? Uh, so you can, we have three protocols, right? One is chronic prophylaxis, one is post-exposure and then early treatment. I love uh, that my patients, family, I would love for them to have a prescription at home and I'll tell you why. One of the central factors of treating any illness is early. Earlier you treat and can intervene on the pathophysiology, the better patients do. And that's totally true with ivermectin. Ivermectin day one works way better than day five. In fact, the only times I've struggled and I've heard other doctors struggle with getting patients better with ivermectin is when they present late. The later they present, the more you have to add on, you have to do double and triple therapy with other, other medicines. And so having it at home is key. I, I absolutely think having it like on hand to take upon first symptoms. Man, you get a sniffle, boom, start it. That's what I would say. You have sniffles. Yeah. Are you okay? I'm okay. You also but have a nice not, tan. Yeah. We know you're not in Ohio. No, I am not. Uh, I'm supposed to be on vacation, but the WHO was, wants to mess with me. Or Wisconsin, anyway. Well, yeah. we, we're glad to see you have I, at least gotten out in the sun. All I right. Have. Rivka Alfie says, if someone takes ivermectin prophylactically, does it reduce their body's ability to use ivermectin in the event they do get sick later on? I guess you build up an immunity to no, it. No, so, so it's not a drug like that. You wouldn't have a tolerance. Um, in fact, if anything, I guess the question is if you're on it chronically and then you get sick, would it worsen your chances? I'm gonna say you're gonna get a milder disease because the inoculum would be prevented. Remember, uh, ivermectin is a blocker. It's not perfect. The, the trials where they took it once a week, it was perfect. Uh, those that took it twice uh, every two weeks or monthly, it was single digits protection. But um, my my understanding of the pathophysiology and the way I've remembered is, is you would get less severe disease, not more. Okay. Kimberly Wolford wants to know, is there any chance that all the ivermectin could be approved to be sold over the counter in the United States? And what is the process to try to get that done? Ha! And I'm not laughing at that person. I love that person's question. Um, we, can't you, even, we, we can't even get it recommended. And now we're going to make it over the counter. Uh, not going to happen. Um, I, I mean, it would have to, I mean, FDA would go, would have fits with, with many, many bars, thousands of feet high to try to hurdle to get that happen. But let me flip that question on its head and say, somebody has done it and they did it within the last month. And that's the country of Bulgaria. They went all in and they just made it simple and they made it over the counter. And the newspaper showed lines of people uh, lining up outside of pharmacies in Bulgaria. And so uh, it, it can be done. Uh, I just don't see it for the US. It's over the counter in Mexico too. Yeah, in a lot of places. Uh, well, I'll tell the group, I'm in Dominican Republic right now uh, and I just bought $50 worth yesterday. 
Um, it was a dollar a pill, six milligrams, right, right over the counter, no problem. So go to the islands for a nice yeah. little vacation, do a little snorkeling yeah. and swimming and get some sun. Okay, well, there you go. Uh, Mark Minerding wants to know, was any action taken after your testimony before a congressional committee supported by Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin some time ago? Yeah, so that's one of our greatest successes as well as failures. Uh, you know, we did get an audience with the NIH panel. We presented along with the WHO team, uh, the team lead. Uh, and they changed their recommendation from recommending against use outside of trials to one that's neutral. So we got them to shift and come up with somewhat reasonable one, but we, I, I think it's a grave disappointment because I thought it was, I think it was a historic missed opportunity to save lives. Had they even come up with a cautious recommendation, uh, it would have been fine. You know, the, the, one other point I want to make on that is that the other thing that they are doing in this diversion and deception is when I say moving the goalpost, the other side is pretending that to recommend a drug, you need what's called level 1A evidence, meaning you need a 10,000 person randomized control trial, double blind by a pharmaceutical company or academic medical center, and that's the only way you can recommend a drug. Wrong. Many drugs have far weaker recommendations. You don't have to wait for 1A, but all of the language of these uh, organizations are saying, nope, you don't have 1A evidence, so we can't make a recommendation. If you look at the NIH guidelines, they have 1A, 1B, 1C, 2A, 2B, 2C. Hey, does anyone out there know what remdesivir sits on right now? What kind of strength of evidence it sits on at $3,000 a dose and every patient in this country gets? It's a 2BA. It's not strong, and yet it's standard of care, not only in this country, but in many countries. We don't need a 1A. You can have a 3A. Expert opinion. I'm an expert. Give ivermectin. Okay. Let's, Mary, we got a lot of questions. A lot of people. A lot of people watching. Mary Cummins Collins wants to know, is there a sense that ivermectin will help fight the variants? I'm vaccinated now, but I'm thinking I should still keep taking it pro prophylactically as I've been every other week. What do you think? So, yeah, I like those variant questions. Uh, first off, I want to remember, because I'm getting words that, that donations are coming in, and I just want to say, guys, oh, thank, you, thank, thank you. you. You're fighting with us. I'm seeing some of the really positive comments. Yeah. Uh, there's good people out there. I, I'm telling you, you're, not only your money is supporting us, but the sentiments are supporting us, so thank you. But in regards to the variants, I got to tell you, I'm looking at the data. Juan Chimie looks at the data all the time. I talk to Juan. I'm like, hey, Juan, what's going on in this country? What's going on in this city? And here's what we know. If last week we talked to, uh, or we got a lot of reports from Jackie Stone, in Zimbabwe, 60 to 90% of COVID there was the South African variant, the big, bad South African variant. They slayed COVID with ivermectin in Zimbabwe. So South African variant, check. Let's talk about the Brazilian variant. If you look at Belém and Manaus, uh, Manaus got overrun until the mayor said everyone starts to use Evermectin. The numbers went down, completely demolished it, and that was the P1 variant. So the Brazilian variant is showing that Evermectin is holding up, check. Then the UK variant, the numbers in Slovakia are improving. We're seeing the death rates go down. And so the UK variant seems to be fell by, by, by uh, Evermectin. So I don't have hard granular data, but with reports and what we're seeing on a, on, a, on a big scale is that all variants are susceptible to ivermectin, which makes sense. It has many mechanisms of action. Uh, and thank you all for the donations from me too. We are so grateful. This is really great news. Nanette Mitchell wants to know, how does the WHO decision impact our ability to receive ivermectin? <laughs> well, it, in the U.S., it does make a difference, right? I mean, in the U.S., uh, ivermectin is available. It's available at all the pharmacies. It is um, FDA so far, approved, right? Not for COVID, but you can give off-label. Uh, prescribing off-label is as common as the day is long. I mean, twenty percent of prescriptions in the U.S. are off-label. So, your doctor can prescribe off-label. The real question is. How many more doctors are going to prescribe ivermectin? I think I think the road to widespread adoption just got longer and windier and and steeper. Uh, I, I mean, it's just the doctor. Many doctors really don't want to take risks. They're risk averse. They want to do what they're told or what they think is safe. Uh, they think it's the right thing, and they they might be right, except for when they're wrong. 
Um, and, and so you're, you're in a system where you really need leadership guidance. And when you don't get it and you get them all piling up like the Europeans, the WHO and, and the Americans, um, it, it really makes it hard. It makes it hard. We do know that there are doctors working for hospitals and the doctors want to use it and the hospitals won't let them do it. All over the place. All over the place. That's tragic. That's tragic because the doctor and, knows and, the patient and, and knows what the patient needs. That's the, that's the other thing that we just don't see talked about in COVID, which is I've been a doctor for almost 20 years. I have never in my career been told by anyone what I can and can't use to treat a disease. Like I've always been able to use my clinical rationale, reasoning, observation, knowledge of the, of the efficacy and mechanisms of action of medicines and say, you know, I think we should do this or that. No one's ever stopped me. Now, suddenly you have a whole system where hospital systems will not stock ivermectin. They don't even want to allow one individual doctor to use ivermectin. I don't get it. Dr. Paul Marek cannot give ivermectin in his hospital system. They've outlawed it. And he is amazing, an amazing expert. One of the best doctors in the world. Okay, Michael Paul, what is the status of Japan's use of ivermectin? They seemed ready to delve into it a few weeks ago. Yeah, so we're getting encouraging reports. So. Uh, professor Amora, he's, you know, he's older, he's, I think, 86 now, but, you know, his team of professors um, at the Institute, um, uh, Dr. Yagasawa, who is the first author on that recent review paper, um, I, I've had multiple correspondences with him, and, you know, they are saying that they are making headway. They, they're having, I think, what sounds like healthy conversations with some of the regulatory agencies, so they're hopeful. Uh, they're cognizant that the wheels of government move slowly, right? It moves at the speed of government, uh, which is glacial, uh, even in emergencies. But, um, they, but they were giving me encouraging news. I, I think they felt they were making progress. That's all I can say. We have a question from Mark Mikkel, who says, where is Dr. Andrew Hill? Is uh, this his fault? Uh, has he done his duty? Yeah. So Dr. Hill, um, what can I say about Dr. Hill? Dr. Hill says uh, that, you know, his job is to amass, compile, analyze the data and present the reports. And that's what he's doing. That's what his team has done. They've done it all pandemic for multiple repurposed drugs. All of the others have failed except for ivermectin. They've done 24 seven ivermectin since November. Um, I know he's cleaning up and reporting the data. And that's, that's why, like, I know that the WHO, I believe, I, he hasn't given me exact numbers, but they have data from over two dozen trials. They, they clearly haven't reviewed all of them because they said they only based it on 16 today, but they have results from over two dozen. Um, I believe that Dr. Hill is going to give lectures soon. I think his work and his contract is up. Um, and when he does, he says he's going to finish his peer-reviewed manuscript reporting the entire body of the trials. And I hope he's around to give lectures because I got to tell you, he has data that we don't and that we want. And I hope he's willing to share it for the sake of everybody. It's your feeling based as, as a scientist looking at this and seeing these trials come in and having talked to Andrew that this is basically going to be proven to be a very effective drug for this, right? All that, you know, unequivocally. We've said that Dr. Hill, before he was not allowed to share publicly, his last public lectures, <coughs> his recommendations to the world is get supplies, get ready to deploy, make a plan. There's enough evidence here to show it's effective. You got to figure out how to uh, amass and distribute. Um, and some countries have listened. And the bird? panel also said the same thing. I mean, Absolutely. big time. And okay, we, we have one more, one more question and that is, please explain the use of quercetin and zinc in the protocol. Yeah, so quercetin has uh, important antiviral and anti-inflammatory properties. I'm gonna say, I wish Paul was here. I give him all quercetin um, That's uh, Paul questions. Uh, yeah. But if, if you read our Math Plus protocol paper, which was published some months ago, um, Paul wrote the section, uh, the review, and our paper is on our website. So I would just encourage you to read um, why zinc is important and why quercetin is important. Okay. 
I guess that's all the questions we have time for. So I need to wrap it up here. Thank you, Dr. Corey. We Thank hope you, you get a little snorkeling in before the your time is out here. Um, that's all the questions we have time for. But if you didn't get your question in, don't worry, because we'll be back next week. We're still going to try to keep doing this. Um, same time, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, and everything in between. In the meantime, we would love to have you join the FLCCC Alliance. It's on our website. You go to flccc.net. If you haven't been there before, there's a lot of good stuff there. And we're always updating it. We're always changing it to make it more readable, make it easier to find things. All the new studies that come in, it's that, you know, check it out every so often. But you look for network and support and you can sign up to be somebody who will get some news from us. We're going to be doing more newsletters. We haven't gotten it all done. We kind of short of staff, but we're working on it. Uh, at any, got another special thing for you. At any rate, one more thing. Some of you are here because you have an ivermectin story. And I suspect a lot of you are here because you have an ivermectin story. For some reason, you know personally uh, that what our doctors are saying, that the treatments they created that this drug ivermectin that they really discovered uh, worked back in October uh, based on good science that these treatments really work despite what you're reading in the other news. Anyway, tell us your story, put it on video, talk into your phone or your iPad or your MacBook or whatever, you, whatever devices you have. Do it casually, do it like you talk to your kids or whatever, or you're, like your kids talk to each other. Anyway, tell us your story because these are interesting and the world needs to know them. We've done some, you've seen the videos we've done. This is important. And if you do it and you put it up on YouTube, use the hashtag Ivermectin works. Hashtag Ivermectin works with you telling your story. We want to know the stories and we want the world to know your stories. If you're a doctor and prescribe it, say you've got 395 patients that have been using it and none wound up in the hospital. If you're a patient, tell us how sick you were and how you got over it. This is important for people to hear. So that's, that's your homework. Um, meanwhile, you know, we're making the videos. We are out there. We're going to be still out there <laughs> following the science putting patients first. That's what we do. We're most grateful for those of you who made donations tonight and any of you that can grab somebody else and find them to give us a little more to keep this going because it's hard. We're, we're fighting major, major money, as you might imagine, and um, it's just hard to do. But we really feel that people's lives matter. People's lives should matter more than big budgets and money and profits. So anyway, that's where we're coming from. Thank you for watching. Thanks. And we will see you next week. Thanks, Betsy. Have a good Bye. night, everyone. Thanks for joining. Bye. Thank you all.